So just to start, for people who don't know who I am, uh, I am Chuck Lieber. I'm a, an upstream Linux contributor. Um, been working on Linux for almost 20 years, I guess, working in the NFS area for, um, for over 15 years. Um, I'm also an active member of the uh, IETF NFS v4 working group, and I collaborate closely with the Solaris NFS uh, development team. Um, and I'm here to talk about a few things uh, regarding NFS over RDMA. Uh, last time I was here was two years ago, I think, and I think a lot has happened since then, so just wanted to give you a lowdown on some of that. And uh, I also want to mention what I'm not going to cover today. Um, this is kind of a safe harbor statement. I'm not going to talk about products of any kind, either Linux Linux products like uh, what's in distributions or Oracle products. Um, Oracle, of course, has a Linux distribution of its own. I'm um, not going to put up slides that talk about uh, quantitative performance results. I might talk about relative performance. Um, and I'm not going to talk about uh, NFS over RDMA adoption rates. So I'm sorry to disappoint you all on that, on that regard. But what I am going to talk about, if I can try to avoid bearing the lead, is uh, what I'm doing with NFS over RDMA uh, to address uh, microsecond awareness. Uh, I, was just, uh, I just learned about this interesting uh, Google paper that talks about you know, the, the uh, basic architectural changes that we have to make to our operating system software to adapt to this new world of uh, ultra low latency network fabrics and uh, high performance uh, memory speed uh, storage or persistent memory. Um, so I'm gonna walk through what I've been doing in that regard for the last couple of years and where I think I'm gonna be going next. So I decided to call this open source highlights instead of Linux highlights because I've been working a little bit on some other things besides just the in-kernel Linux NFS client. This, the NFS client is where I started um, a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago. Um, but uh, I branched out a little bit. I've overcome my fear of uh, working on uh, user space graphic user interfaces. And um, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so there are two key new features in the last year um, I think last time I was at uh, this meeting, I talked to folks at the user group, and they said they'd be very interested in, in support for uh, NFS over RDMA with Kerberos. Um, so I made that happen. Uh, you might ask, well, why do I need Kerberos? I mean, InfiniBand infrastructure is pretty secure. You know, it's usually uh, machine room area or it's warehouse area. You don't really have to worry about intrusion well. I think there, there are deployments that do want to have Kerberos authentication. Um, and um, in order to make NFS v4 work with Kerberos, I need to have a couple of pieces of Kerberos, uh, KRB5i, uh, Kerberos integrity working. And Kerb5p just sort of came along for the ride. Um, we'll call that uh, feature parity with TCP so that we have NFS over RDMA with Kerberos working for all three pseudo flavors. Um, there's a reason why that came late. Um, on average, NFS operations with Kerberos are larger than with AuthSys, and that pushes the, uh, the way you assemble NF uh, RPC over RDMA uh, requests into a different realm, a slightly different realm. Uh, you need different combinations of chunks. Um, you use chunks more often just because the size of these things is larger. And with Curve5i and Curve5p, um, the host CPU is already touching the data payload you know, to, to compute uh, checksum, integrity checksum, or to encrypt the, the payload. So you know, the benefits of uh, an offloaded data transfer that, doesn't t that the host CPU doesn't touch sort of go away. Um, and that has to be taken into account. Um, the other missing piece here was there was no standard, no specification uh, that described how, you know, just how um, interoperating implementations would interact when using these sort of more uh, advanced forms of RPC over RDMA. So I had to sort of fix up Linux to work with Kerberos, and then I had, uh, 
then I had to go off and uh, make sure that the st standards uh, reflected the um, implementations that we have, which is Solaris and Linux. Um, so I've gotten that out of the way. Um, so I want to talk about the, the top bullet on this slide, which is, I think, probably more important to folks in this room. Um, and I'll explain why. Um, NFS version 4.1 um, has one feature of it that wasn't supported at all in RDMA, and that was the back channel. That's the very first sub bullet there. The back channel uh, with NFS v4.1 goes over the same connection as the forward channel. So operations from the client to the server requests, NFS requests, go over that channel, and um, with starting with NFS v4.1, the callback request from the server to manage things like delegations uh, comes over the same connection. That didn't happen in NFS v4.0. Um, so we had to be careful and create a, a mechanism in RPC over RDMA for making those operations work in the backwards direction. Um, no, well, sorry, we're call calling it the reverse direction now. Um, that also required standards work, and uh, I will talk about that in, a, in the third section of my talk today. Um, so that's important. Why is NFS v4.1 important? Um, well, it gives you uh, sessions, which is exactly one semantics for RPCs. That's very, very important for, thing, for data critical applications like databases. Um, it gives you um, PNFS, which I mentioned before. That's parallel NFS. I'll go into a little more detail about what that means and why that's important for performance uh, in a minute. Uh, and it also gives us access to the features of NFS version 4.2, which is newly minted. Um, these features focus on enabling uh, uh, virtualization and cloud. Um, for example, uh, allocate is mentioned up there. Basically what that is is uh, kind of a write same so that you can say, I'd like to create a 40 gigabyte disk image on my NFS server. Um, and I don't want to have to have the client write every single one of those 40 gigabytes. I would like to have the server just create that out of whole cloth. So I can do a write same and say, make me a zero filled file, and the server will just go and do that. Uh, read plus is a sparse read capability that um, reveals the holes in files, that is the unallocated pieces on the, in the server's file system. Um, that is uh, important for um, thin provisioning and, and storing uh, very large files uh, as compactly as possible and returning them to clients as compactly as possible. Um, and then seek hole is another way of discovering uh, these unallocated pieces of files. I didn't mention one, an, another important feature and that is server to server copy. That's the ability for a client to request a, a partial or full copy of a file. Uh, it, and it can go either on this, to another file on the same server or it can go to a, a file on another server. These are, I think, uh, very interesting, very important new features that are now enabled because NFS over RDMA has the ability to do NFS v4.1. I've also been looking at performance and scalability. Uh, I mentioned microsecond awareness earlier. And you know all that means is, you know, it used to be that IO took a millisecond on the order of a millisecond or maybe 10 or even 30 or 50. Uh, well, it doesn't anymore. We've got these very fast storage technologies like NVMe or even persistent memory. And uh, you know, a context switch to wait for a, a, an IO to complete just isn't needed anymore. IO is complete in three to five microseconds now. Um, so it's getting a lot more difficult for um, uh, operating systems to overlap processing and I.O. Um, one of the things you do in cases like this is, is uh, you poll a lot more, you busy wait a lot more. Um, but you know, I don't think we've actually got a good understanding of how the architecture of operating systems needs to change to adapt to these, these, uh, these faster technologies. Um, basically, they're very good at dealing with a couple hundred uh, nanosecond waits uh, you basically have the CPU block while you're doing a load or store to, uh, to slow memory. Uh, and it, they deal very well with long waits for traditional I.O. Um, you just do a context switch. But context, doing a context switch is about as expensive uh, as uh, an I.O. on something like RDMA. 
Um, so uh, we really have to face that. I'm trying to face that in uh, the NFS stack as a whole um, as we're moving to uh, um, durable storage technology and network fabrics that, that can go at these speeds. Um, so I've made a number of changes um, here. I've listed them. They're, I guess the details aren't that important, but uh, uh, I put this here for posterity for people who want to download the slides from the, from the website and, 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 or ask me about this stuff later. Um, in place RDMA send is kind of interesting because one of the things we're thinking about is, is using uh, very large send operations, single RDMA send and single RDMA receive um, to move data uh, so that we don't require a memory registration and validation cycle, which can be somewhat costly. Um, of course, there's a limit to how large you want that, but you know, if you're sending a couple of pages with RDMA send, you really don't want the host CPU to copy that data. You want to just send that in place, and that's what the, this does. You, it uh, sets up the pages um, in the uh, send uh, scatter gather list, and they're sent in place. Um, these experimental features I mentioned at the bottom are uh, important for new versions of RPC over RDMA that we're working on uh, to support uh, remote invalidation and, uh, as I mentioned, uh, sending uh, larger requests using a single RDMA send. One of the important things that has come about since the last time I was here talking to you uh, is the, the depth of our uh, uh, continuous testing. Um, one thing I didn't mention that on this particular slide is, is uh, that we now have presence, NFS over RDMA presence at every, um, we have it, uh, it was three out of four of the last testing events had NFS over RDMA presence, um, which is good. I mean, generally that's just an Ethernet only event, but now it's, it's Ethernet and InfiniBand, and we hope maybe we'll be rocky as well at some point. Um, but that, that's an important development because it, it puts uh, NFS over RDMA presence uh, in front of a, a body of, of testers uh, at these events. Um, another important change is the first bullet here that talks about the Linux server. When I was here last, uh, I think I was petitioning for people to volunteer for uh, supporting uh, uh, development on the Linux server. And uh, now that I'm more comfortable working on the NFS client, and uh, the, the RDMA work there, I've been starting to look at uh, Linux server, uh, in, the in-kernel server, improving that and uh, making sure that, it's, uh, that it interoperates well and that it performs well um, with both Solaris and Linux uh, NFS clients. Um, I think I mentioned last time I was here, uh, the, variety, the way I'm, I'm testing uh, the variety of uh, uh, HCAs and RNICs. Um, basically, I'm farming that out to, to uh, the vendors who are interested. Um, so that would be uh, Broadcom and Mellanox and Chelsea and the folks who really want this to work well. Um, they have access to the upstream patches uh, during every merge window and have the ability to, to run some testing. I help them design their tests, uh, design their QA, uh, uh, their test plans. Um, I've been able to reduce the number of registration modes we have to test. Uh, I think last time I was here it was five on the Linux NFS client, and now it's down to two. Um, only FMR and FRWR are supported in the Linux NFS client now, um, and that makes our test matrix a lot smaller. Um, there's some bad news here. The platform diversity is pretty narrow. We're talking about x86 only. Um, I know I've gotten some requests from uh, IOL for help with uh, problems on uh, PPC64, and unfortunately, I, I can't be of much help other than looking at uh, individual or particular problems there. Um, I don't have any regular access to PPC64 hardware. Um, we have looked for um, volunteers, but uh, no one was able to provide it. And so we don't have any real statement of support upstream for PPC64, NFS over already on, on, the, on the platform. Um, and uh, I don't have regular access to ARM or, or Z390. I'm, I'm not sure anybody in here would care about Z390. But, um, but we are definitely focused on x86. Um, and lastly, um, Doug pointed out a, a lack of 
a lack of uh, testing around IOMMU, and that's obviously a very important configuration for certain uh, types of hardware, including Z390. Uh, but it's also important uh, in virtualized environments. Uh, the physical host has to use the IOMMU for um, doing uh, uh, address mapping. And if that's not working, then virtualization is not working. And we obviously want that to work well. Um, but since Doug pointed that out to me, uh, I'm, I basically developed with it turned on now. And uh, I've, I've found problems with it, and I've gotten experience with uh, the uh, um, debugging facilities in the kernel, the IOMMU related debugging facilities. So all good news, I think, except for the platform diversity issue. So I had mentioned overcoming my fear of uh, GUI development earlier, um, and this is what I meant. Um, I've been working on uh, improving the uh, existing RPC over RDMA dissector in Wireshark. This means that with a HCA that supports um, capturing network traffic, I can feed it into Wireshark and it will actually show me the RPC over RDMA um, parts of the frame dissected properly and it will recognize these and feed them into the RPC dissector which then feeds them into the NFS dissector. And so, uh, this is an exceptionally useful tool. Um, it's not finished yet. Um, I need to, to uh, build support for combining um, the uh, RDMA read and write traffic with, uh, with the uh, correct uh, RPC over RDMA transport headers to get a whole packet for NFS read and NFS write. When those are large, then uh, RDMA read or write is involved, and that's still not associated cor correctly with uh, with the uh, RPC of RDMA header. So there's a little work to do. This is appearing in uh, 2.3, which is, I guess, in pre-release now. Um, I'm told that uh, the typical Wireshark release in distributions is 2.0. Um, the Wireshark community prefers to do its own backporting, and they've backported some of this into 2.2 and 2.0, um, not back into the 1.x releases. So this is probably to appear sometime in the future, I don't know when. Or if you like to build and run Wireshark from the source code, you can use it today. So as I mentioned before, I've been working on uh, standards uh, uh, that uh, relate to RPC over RDMA and NFS over RDMA. And we've sort of been digging in this, in this field um, for about a year and a half. And um, we have our set of wishes and we have our set of known issues. And so I'm gonna walk through that a little bit um, to sort of explain why I'm taking the direction I am uh, with, a, with a development work. Um, so this is the uh, obligatory magical ponies uh, with rainbows uh, slide. Um, I think uh, Jeff put up a slide that showed that NFS writes are about half the speed of NFS reads. I think that was, it was like 12 gigabytes per, or 12 gigabits per second versus 20. Um, those numbers are better today with, with the upstream, the current upstream. Uh, with reads, I can get wire speed uh, with uh, FDR, for example. And, uh, but with writes, it's still about half uh, the speed of reads. And we've sort of been staring at this and wondering why for a long time. Um, I think we probably have a good answer for that now and it's, it's not the transport. It's not NFS over RDMA itself. It's the NFS server. Um, and so this is one of those times when we've got um, new durable storage technology and new f network fabrics and they're demonstrating that our our old stack is a great need for improvement. Um, we'd like to see one single client be able to drive a million IOPS. It would be a big client, of course, and it would have more than one RNIC in it, but it should be able to get there. Um, so far, um, on one connection, I'm getting about 110 uh, kilo IOPS. And so the way we want to get there is uh, by opening more connections to the server. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and I, I had I already mentioned this before. Um, we think NFS over RDMA is very well positioned to, uh, to um, give us the performance benefits of uh, the fast 
the ultra low latency network fabrics and uh, um, per, uh, technologies like per persistent memory. Um, it's going to need some massaging. And uh, I think uh, Christoph uh, thoroughly worked the issue of uh, uh, large pages. So I'm not going to go into that uh, very much here. But suffice it to say, it's coming. Um, one way that uh, operating systems are going to deal with uh, the, the huge uh, memory capacity of systems like uh, um, systems that have 3D crosspoint, for example, um, those systems like have up to six terabytes of addressable RAM. And uh, you have to do something about how you manage those pages. And so one solution, of course, is use larger page sizes. And so I think NFS over RDMA is going to have to make some adjustments there. One of the things that's, I think, holding the Linux kernel back in that regard is the fact that file systems um, still kind of depend on the, so the, the limited page size of the page, pages and page cache, and that's 4K. Um, the block sizes on, uh, on, on spinning Rust drives today is 4K. The block sizes on SSDs is 4K. Um, so that's one of the things that's kind of holding us back. Um, but I think you know, as, as you get a page cache full of uh, large pages, two megabyte pages, or even two gigabyte pages, um, NFS over RDMA is going to have to accommodate that. So I did mention some of these dragons already. Um, um, I could probably walk through some of these, um, or you could just read them yourselves, I guess. <laughs> um, one of the things that we fight with um, regularly is that um, storage uh, protocols that are RDMA enabled are typically um, pull mode, which means that the storage targets use RDMA read to pull data from the, the clients, from the storage initiators. And that means there's an extra round trip. Um, we don't like round trips, especially um, when uh, the networks are really fast because that, that doubles the latency of, of operations, some operations. So we would like to get rid of that round trip. Um, I mentioned before that we have uh, only a few and sometimes um, typically only one connection per client server pair. Um, that means only one QP um, per, per mount point in Linux. Um, Solaris has up to eight connections, so that would be eight QPs. Um, so they can, they can move the data a little faster than, than Linux can. Uh, but uh, that's a that's a Linux only uh, limitation. Um, that's not a limitation of the actual um, protocol. Um, and then uh, on the theme of uh, microsecond awareness, uh, RPC stacks are very dependent on context switches and uh, heavyweight locking, and that needs to be taken care of if we want to support um, very fast I/O on the servers. Um, I'm told I only have five minutes, so I will, I will move on. Uh, we found a, num a number of uh, uh, protocol-related uh, issues. These are actually issues we want to fix in RPC over RDMA. Um, I've mentioned some of these before at this event. Um, for example, the ability to manage uh, canceled RPCs. Uh, a control C right now uh, risks um, the server writing into an invalidated memory region uh, when it actually finishes the RPC, and that can cause a connection loss, a spurious connection loss. Um, I mentioned before um, we don't have support for remote invalidation in the base RPC over RDMA protocol. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of other ones that, are, that uh, really sort of get into the weeds, uh, so I won't go into those right now. There are a number of problems with credit accounting in the current protocol. Um, we want to be able to send one directional RPC messages. For example, we want to have a control plane where we can send you know, operations that involve uh, just you know, send one. The credit accounting uh, requires a reply so that the client knows when it can send another. Um, so we have to address that somehow. So what are we going to do about all this? Um, well, the first thing is uh, we're going to do we're going to adopt something that I think Jeff was Jeff knows the second uh, presentation uh, refer, the LNet uh, folks are referring to it as multi-rail SMB refers to it as multi-channel uh, I think uh, at the NFS community is adopting a, uh, the name multi-path uh, basically we want uh, a single client and server to be able to um, interoperably uh, open and use multiple um, network connections between a client and server 
Um, and it should be able to do this um, if, the, if, both, if either side has multiple NICs um, of mixed capabilities, either TCP or RDMA or both, um, then the client should be able to discover these capabilities in band that is with an NFS request and, and be able to, to uh, discover the, the network paths and use them. Um, so right now I'm working with uh, uh, a colleague, Andy Adamson, on uh, writing a specification for this. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, by the way, um, another way of doing this is uh, MPTCP, um, and we have some good results with that. Um, uh, that's basically what MPTCP is designed to do. However, it doesn't give us the ability to mix RDMA and TCP, uh, which is something we would like to do. So I mentioned PNFS before. Um, for folks who don't know what this is, uh, this is a parallel NFS. It's been around for about 10 years. Um, it gives um, a client the ability to um, stripe files and file sets across multiple storage targets. Um, an MDS uh, is used to um, mock up the directory namespace and the client contacts the MDS to, get, um, to do lookups and get adders and things of that nature. Um, but then the file data is actually spread across multiple data stores. Um, PNFS also gives the ability to access those data stores via protocols other than NFS. So for example, uh, the MDS can say, uh, oh, Mr. NFS client, um, you're actually on the same network fabric as your data stores, so you can use iSCSI, for example, to get at the blocks of data that are on those targets. And now, uh, imagine if uh, all of the protocols were RDMA enabled, so you would use uh, NFS over RDMA to access the MDS, and you could use ICER or SRP or even NVMe on fabrics in RDMA mode. Um, so that's a, a, a very excellent performance accelerator. Um, but then moving forward, and that's, uh, that you can do today, by the way. Um, now, um, my colleague Tom Talpy has been talking about push mode for, I think, two years at least. Easy. Um, we would like to bring that to NFS as well. And what that means is that the, the NFS client would be uh, able to do RDMA operations directly to persistent storage uh, somewhere uh, on the fabric. Maybe it's on the same uh, MDS as it's using to, to um, um, access the file namespace, or maybe it's on stupid storage bricks that are nothing but persistent memory. Uh, but the point is that um, we should be able to access um, that, the, the client should be able to access that storage just by doing RDMA read and write once it's, it's set up by a, an NFS operation. Um, and I think we're there, uh, we're getting there. Uh, uh, my colleague uh, Christoph Helwig has uh, created um, some uh, prototypes of this um, so we know it's possible and uh, he's getting good performance results. Um, we're definitely going to write this up as, a, as an NFS specification um, so that other people can do it too. As a layout, yes. Um, so I'll, uh, since I'm out of time, I will skip the, the talk about the standards work, but I will talk about what I want to focus on in 2017, like in the next 12 months. Uh, definitely, I think we need to do a lot more for uh, um, recovery from uh, network partitions and from connection loss and from, uh, in this case, I'm talking about uh, specifically device removal events. Um, the NFS so already made client in uh, Linux was never able to support this, but now it is. So. You know, if, if, for example, you unplug uh, a device, an HCA, actually remove it from a machine, um, you can do that while there are NFS mounts. Um, I've got the code for this and I'm hoping to merge it in 4.12. Um, this also gives us the ability, I'm hoping it gives us the ability to, to fail over to uh, a different device or even uh, manage uh, suspend resume without too much interference with the workload. Um, we have some more Kerberos interop issues to work. Uh, on their Linux to Linux uh, interop is very good. Uh, Linux to Solaris is, is uh, problematic, um, but it should be um, straightforward to, to fix, and I, I will do that this year. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, uh, I think multipathing, uh, the ability to open multiple connections between one client and one server uh, is, is, a, is critical to reaching our million IOPS goal. 
Um, and so that's something I'm going to be focusing on. Um, and then there are some other things that are our are, are basic good housekeeping that are the last couple of bolts here. Um, and then I'll close by mentioning that um, we see the trend towards uh, away from InfiniBand uh, towards uh, Rocky V2. And so my development environment is going to be moving, transitioning from InfiniBand only to uh, Rocky V2 um, this year. So um, any questions? I have a quick question. What's the underlying cause for only one Q pair on Linux? Where does that restriction come from? Well, it's partly political. Um, for a long time, the um, NFS client maintainer believed that um, it was the best way to keep the um, recovery um, machinery in the client robust is to use one connection. Um, and so that's where we've been for many years. Um, recently, he's had a change of heart. Uh, and so he's permitted the work on uh, multipathing to go on. And uh, now that we have a sense that he would actually accept it uh, for merging upstream, we've decided to embrace it whole hog. A lot of us have been waiting for this opportunity for a long time. Um, so we're going to take it. Um, so two things. Uh, you had a, a slide up originally that talked about the um, cross-platform testing and everything else. Uh, we don't have all of those platforms available, but I can say that inside Red Hat we have most of them. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is just a, a FYI. Uh, we'll step up and volunteer to help with that. I and then the second thing, the, the second thing I wanted to ask you about um, is off a little bit off topic from your presentation, but directed more towards you personally. Since you deal with the NFS client and now more with the NFS server upstream in the Linux kernel, my question to you is, you stood up a little bit earlier during the um, object storage on Linux talk to ask some questions about whether they had tried this or tried that um, when they were doing their object store. My question to you is, would you have been interested personally in helping them when they were designing and testing that? Designing and testing their object store? Yeah, had you, would you have been interested in providing input and feedback to them maybe about what they could do and how they could make it better? Because for example, they said they're working with RHEL 6, right? Well, we all know that's pretty ancient at this point. There might have been some suggestions that could be made about better versions or things of that nature. Um, so I'm still not clear. You mean helping them improve their NFS over RDMA deployment or helping them with the development of the object uh, um, software? So here's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, if somebody's a, an upstream developer and you're working on something like, I don't know, a, a motion sensitive three axis gyro chip that goes into every mobile phone in America, the last thing that developer wants to do is interact directly with the end users because there's going to be 37 million of them with probably 4.5 million questions. You just can't do it, right? Mm -hmm. There needs to be a buffer layer. The HPC space is drastically different. What do we, we measure the HPC sp uh, space in the top 500 systems. And out of those top 500 systems, a number of them at the bottom of the, the list are pretty old, right? So large-scale HPC systems come along at a pretty slow pace. So if a developer were to talk to an HPC, um, someone who's actually deploying an HPC cluster, you're probably not going to get overwhelmed by um, people wanting to talk to you. And that's, that represents an opportunity as a developer to have some input on, to find some things out about, and to interact with something that uh, we never get. I, I never, inside Red Hat, get the opportunity to work with a multi-node, uh, multi-thousand node cluster. I, we have a cluster inside Red Hat, but you know, they're not gonna buy that, right? And so something like that could be useful, at least from my perspective, and one of the differences between the Linux community and, and let's say, for instance, Microsoft, is if somebody's deploying a, cl a cluster with Microsoft software, everything's in one place. If they have a problem with SIFS or Samba or anything like that, it all goes to 
the same place, the vendor. The problem in our community is the vendor is oftentimes the hardware vendor, but that doesn't mean it's the software vendor. And so in deploying some of this stuff, some people have asked what could um, the role of the OFA be going forward. And something I had thought about while listening to your talk and this other talk is that one of the things the OFA might be able to do is to help connect people that do the development, such as yourself, to people who are actively trying to figure out how to use your software in a large-scale deployment to make it better. And so my question is, would that even interest you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So let me just make one quick comment. Um, I'm going to address this a little bit on my talk on Friday because um, there's a lot of restrictions that come around some organizations that deploy HPC, which, which we have to try to break through. And some of these partnerships it would be great to partner with to basically to kind of stroke the management and say, yeah, we know what we're doing. It's okay. We can go outside the box in this arena because we have the support over here. So that's part of the partnership that we need to build. So I recognize that I'm out of time, but I, I think it's important for me to say that um, one of the challenges to working with, uh, with the labs is the fact that they use such old distributions. Um, and obviously, um, I think the, the objects work was important because they were able to do this, I think, uh, largely in user space. Is that right? And that makes it a lot more flexible for them when they're, they're stuck on a particular platform. And as an upstream developer, um, looking at someone who's running uh, RHEL 6, it's difficult for me to come in and say, oh, yeah, you know, I don't know what I can do to help you here because you're on a fixed distribution and, you know, there's a limit to, you know, I, to, to answer Doug's question, absolutely yes, I'd be happy to help and, and consult, but, you know, the, the constraints of what uh, soft, what OSs are deployed in those environments uh, makes it difficult. So um, I need to move on, so thank you very much. <laughs>